His love so undeniable I, I can hardly speak Peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call me Good morning, church family. It's good to see you guys today. It's good to be here with you all at the second of two services we have here at Church at Adams. Thank you for joining us for worship today. If you're joining us online, man, we're glad to see you as well. We're just going to worship the Lord in songs. So if you join us, stand with us. The words will be on the screen. You guys sing along with us today. Just one word. Calm the storm that surrounds me With just one word The darkness has to retreat With just one touch I feel the presence of heaven With just one touch my eyes are open to see My heart can't help but believe There's nothing that our God can't do It's not a mountain that He cannot move so Praise the name that makes a way There's nothing that our God can't do With just one word he was broken inside me With just one word You revive every dream Oh, with just one touch I feel the presence of heaven With just one touch are open to see my heart can't help but believe there's nothing that our God can't do it's not a mountain that he cannot move it's a grace the name that makes a way there's nothing that our God can't do there's nothing that our God can't do it's not a prison wall he can't break Let faith arise, let all 
all agree There's no power like the power Let's sing it out, church All of God's people said, look, I don't know if this crowd's afraid of those cameras or not, but forget that stuff. Don't be afraid of those cameras. They're all good. Welcome those of you at home who are watching. Good to see you. We had a good crowd this morning in the first service. The crowds are getting bigger and bigger. I'm excited. If you're visiting for the first time, there's a card in front of you and or if you have not filled it out, you've been visiting for a while, but you've never filled out that card. Grab that, fill it out so we can get information specific to you about when we're opening back up. We're going to look at opening the church uh, children's ministry back up on the 1st of March, the first week of March. So we're excited about that so that we can get our younger families back into the church and get them plugged in. Uh, so we're excited about that. Put that in there and drop it in the box on the way out. We're still not passing a tithing plate around, so your tithe can go in that box as well, or you can drop it in the door, or go online and set it up. That's an easy way to do it. Uh, whichever works for you, thank you for your faithfulness. Second thing we got talking about is Workday. We have a Workday coming up. It is February 13th at 8 a.m. to 12 noon. There'll be a punch list in the foyer on the wall. Some of you will have specific skill sets. It'll go up tomorrow, Monday, so you can come by the church and look at it and see what it is. We probably can get a Get it up online too, so you can look at it there. And then bring the tools necessary that, is, that will fit that. Whether it rains or not, we have enough indoor stuff to work on as we do outdoor stuff. So you come, join us together to hang out on that work day. And then we have advanced discipleship. It is going to start February 21st. We used to do Discipleship 101. This is an advanced deep training. Dr. Smith and I myself will be teaching this right over here uh, between the two services. So if you come at 10, 15, that is when that is going to start and it will be before the service, right after the first service so that you can plug in. We're gonna do this advanced discipleship training right over here on Sundays starting on the 21st of February at 10, 10. And so it'll be a quick 35 minutes, but it'll be an in-depth study. It'll be really cool for those of you who are wanting a little bit more. Last thing, pray for our communities, pray for our nation, pray for the state. Pray for each other as we look at the, God's vision for our church. We're about, he's about to do a big, huge thing, and uh, I'm excited. We're getting calls. People just seem excited about it, and I want you to be excited because, listen, Satan's going to attack you when you're doing the right thing. He wants to derail you and get you to back off. Don't do that. He loses. If you read the last chapter of the, of the Bible, <laughs> it's all over at the end. He knows it. And he wants to stop you from uh, just being, having a sense of joy. I'm praying for your joy to come back. I'm praying that this COVID thing, we're going to pray for this COVID thing to be over. Amen. And as we step into March and as we get rolling, we're going to go into uh, Easter and we're going to redo our egg hunt and do that thing. So that's a short time away. So be looking for that. Be looking probably for those filled eggs we used to collect. We'll have those out for you. And we're going to get back to normal and get out to reaching the people who desperately need to know Jesus as Savior. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your grace, love, and mercy. Thank you for just, Lord, what you're going to do, what you're about to do. And Father, I pray that as we sing together, as we hear your word, as we study it, that you just move in a great way in our hearts. Speak to us this morning through your spirit, 
For we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, and all of God's people said, amen.
Love that's never failing Let mercy fall on me And everyone needs forgiveness Kindness of a Savior The hope of nations Let's sing it together, church, as we sing it out For a Savior, He can move Savior he can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever, author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave As you find me, all my fears and failures, and fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I just finished up reading through the entire New Testament a couple days ago. In here we read through the whole entire New Testament and we listened to God's word and we covered this place with God's word and, and this morning that's just kind of been on our heart all through the first service and all through in between that we would do what the Great Commission calls us to do. That we would take that word, that light out into our community and let God shine through us. Amen. Because let me remind you we don't just serve a king. We serve the risen King. Amen. So with that in mind, with that in heart, can we just sing that through one more time as our prayer this morning, that God would shine his light through us. Let's sing together. Shine your light in, let the whole world see. Singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light in, let the whole world see. Singing for the glory of the risen King. Father, that is our prayer today. That is my heart, that we would take that word of yours, God, the only truth in this world we have, and that we would take it out into the world and let your light shine through us, God, because none of this matters if it isn't for you. 
And so we give you this time, we give you these songs, and now we give you our heart as we open your word, and we pray that you would use that word, God, to pierce us into the deepest parts of who we are. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen King, and everyone said, amen. You may be seated. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11. We're going to be moving along here to quote the little boy short round of Indiana Jones, hold on to your potatoes, (laughs) right? Chapter 11 of Acts, beginning in verse 1 through 18. Um, Peter is going to get a vision here, and he is going to be told about how the church is supposed to go from there, and this, I think, is going to talk directly to us in a sermon entitled God's Vision for the Church. And so as we look on what we're about to do and where we're going and and how God is going to bless that, we need to be excited about that and be ready to roll. We're going to glean some truths from here. Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. Now the apostles, the brethren who were throughout Judea, heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him. Stop right there, put an asterisk next to verse 2. These are the regular churchgoers or of that tradition. These are the Jewish guys who are upset with them. They had to physically go through this process, and they knew they were separate from the rest of the world. They didn't mix with the rest of the world. They were like, I I got a problem with you talking to other people who are not like us. And this was their issue. They approach Peter and they say, we don't agree that you are going with these other people. Verse 3, saying, they said to him, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them in an orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance uh, I saw a vision, an object coming down like a great sheet lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came right down to me. And when I had fixed my gaze on it and was observing it, I saw the four-footed animals and the earth and the wild beasts and the crawling creatures and the birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean ever entered my mouth. Stop right there for a second. Put an asterisk next to verse seven and eight. He is referring to unclean animals that Jews are not allowed to eat. They don't, you're not going to go to a Jewish pork roast. They're not allowed to eat hoof that certain kinds of animals with cloven hooves and those kinds of things were off their diet. They were considered an unclean animal. He knew that. He grew up that way. He would never touch that. It would defile him. And now he is being shown in this vision that all of these animals are there. And the Lord commands him, go and shoot that hog. And I'm going to teach you how to make baby back ribs. That's, that's my version of that right there. But he says, I, I want you to. And he's saying, no, man, we're not allowed to even touch that stuff. Stay with me. These are the guys complaining to him. Verse 9. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, underline second time, what God has cleansed no longer considered unholy. I want you to see something here. God's saying, and this is your theological and doctrinal reference to the food, you can't eat baby back ribs now. Amen? I'm going to have a better amen. Amen? You guys are like, man, I'm thinking about eating that after this. Verse 10, this happened three times and everything was drawn back up into the sky. I want you to know, look at Peter. Every time is three You're going to deny me three times. And he did. And he comes to him on the shore after that. And he says, do you love me? Three times. And Peter has to get it three times. Something with Peter. He's got a hard head. Everybody go this. I've got a hard head. Sometimes God has to speak to you over and over again to be able to get something across you so you can swallow it and say, "Okay, I'm listening. But sometimes we sit there and we just go, "Mm, no. I heard the Holy Spirit, uh, but I'm not going to move. And God is going to continue to pressure you. He's going to continue to push you. You get convicted over and over again, and you're thinking it's, it's an accident. It's not. It's the Holy Spirit showing up in your life, trying to speak to you. Verse 11. And behold, at the moment, three men appeared at the house in which we were staying, having been sent to me from Caesarea. The Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. These six brethren also went with me, and we entered the man's house. And he reported to us 
how he had seen the angel standing in the house saying, send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here. And we will speak words to you by which you will be saved. Put an asterisk next to verse seven. This is Gentiles. And this guy saw this saying, hey, we're gonna get the word of God now. Do you see that thing on the wall behind me? That's the great commission that Jesus Christ gave the entire world, all of us, not preachers, all of us who are Christians. And he is going in there and he is preaching now the word of God to these people who are there. These guys though are Gentiles. These guys are not Jewish men. There are people who are, are, are not uh, accustomed to the laws of the land. Verse 15, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he did upon us at the beginning. I want you to know his beginning was at Pentecost when he was receiving that. That's when the Holy Spirit, he received the Holy Spirit. Watch this. He was a Jewish guy, knew the law, was following Judaism, was going to church his whole life. Some of you have been going to church nine months before you were ever born. And you were drugged to go to church. You were drugged there and you were drugged home every single time, right? And so you, you are, were, were perhaps raised in the church, but he didn't have the Holy Spirit until he had an understanding of who this Jesus Christ is. I want you to note something, because some of you who were raised in a Catholic tradition like I was, I was baptized in that cute little white dress at my christening, just like a lot of you who were raised that way were. And I thought that was good enough. I've already been baptized. He says, no, the Holy Spirit doesn't come, out, come upon you until after you've made a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and then you're gonna be baptized. And he clearly defines this because he wants you to define a line in your life to say, I am choosing to what? Follow Christ purposely. This is an intentional, phys the, the intentional physicality of the situation where you turn and you are following Christ and you don't care who sees you because he is asking you to profess me before men. Everybody with me? Can I have an amen? amen? All right, stay with me. Verse 15, and as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon the, at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Put an asterisk next to 17. Therefore, if God gave them the same gift as he gave to us also, watch this, after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. He's talking about guys who are not used to, not, they're not church-going people. They're people outside of these walls that we have to go to and we need to present the gospel to, that we need to be purposeful about that. Well, to exercise God's vision, we gotta understand something. I'll tell you a little story about this lady. She was 98 years old. It was Christmas time, and the mother had had won or had got this exercise bike for Christmas. And all the kids thought it would be really cool if they could get grandma up on that exercise bike. She's 98, she can barely stand up straight. They said, come on, grandma, get on the exercise bike. Come on, grandma, get on the exercise. Oh, no, I don't want to. They said, come on, grandma, let's get on there so we can take pictures and probably hope she falls off so they can make a viral picture about or a viral video or something. But they get her up on that bike and grandma got up on the bike, the story goes, and she sat there and everybody was looking at her and she said, okay, go ahead, turn it on. I said, no, grandma, you got a pedal. And I think... I think that's kind of like the church. I think we are kind of like that. I think we think we can magically flip a switch and then watch as the work gets done for us, but it doesn't. This is what the work day is for. This is what you are for. This is what I'm for. You all have been given a spiritual gift. You all have talents that can be used, but it is a body that makes that happen. The work in the church requires this delicate blend of divine inspiration, watch this, and human perspiration that we have to put some sweat and some tears into some stuff. But we do that as a family in order to impact the world. So today's message of scripture is, is, is kind of striking in its similarity to the scripture that we read this morning about today's churches. How many ministers have taken a group or another within the church and they reached the community and, and they maybe perhaps went and reached out to some undesirables? They're like having a club in their church. 
They don't want to go out there. We're not going to go down underneath the bridge in Baton Rouge. I don't, I don't want to reach those kinds of guys. I, I, don't, I don't think you're in the right church. You perhaps need to go to the church down the road because of your color or, 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 or your economic status or something like that. And we have this idea that the church is, is, is that way. And, and oftentimes ministers are called to the carpet to explain the direction of this new ministry or the church. I'm excited about a ministry that Dr. Smith had, had found out about uh, for, for addicts. We, we have people in our community. I, I've done, I don't know how many funerals in the last six months for people who have OD'd. And, and we need to do something as a church inside of it. And this awesome ministry where they take uh, old vehicles and they fix them up. And he had told one of our deacons, Chad Smith, about it. And Chad, Chad, you're not going to see Chad on a soapbox down in New Orleans preaching the gospel because that's not him. But he could turn a wrench and he can do that kind of stuff. And he's excited about this ministry with Dr. Smith about doing a ministry where they fix up cars and they take a car like a 1950 Ford pickup, get it all shiny and pretty. And then they sell the car and they put that money back into the ministry where they can impact people who are struggling in an opioid crisis or who are struggling with addictions. And we can get them into some places like the Home of Grace or these other places where they can be impacted. That is ministry where hands and feet are required. But watch this, he's not a preacher. He's not called to that kind of thing. God has given you specific talents and spiritual gifts to be able to be used as a church to be able to accomplish its vision or its, min its ministry. I've been in churches where the human factor is such that the church is in, in God's vision was threatened by the current power structure of the church. That's just not the way we do it. Our attitudes and old stereotypes prevent churches oftentimes from genuinely being open to the, to the not so gentle nudging of the Holy Spirit. And in this particular passage, Peter is here and he's accosted by these Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. We don't do it that way. That's not the way we do it here. Why are you going to those people across the street? Why are you going to that group underneath the bridge in Baton Rouge? Why do you go, their question, to the uncircumcised men and eat with them? Verse 3. Peter then has to explain that it wasn't his idea. He was only trying to be faithful to the things that God was teaching him and to the directions in which God was leading his ministry. Let me tell you something. I said this before to you and I'm saying it again. You called me to be your pastor, not to be your friend. That means my job is to equip and train and give you the truth of what the scripture says. This is what Peter was telling those guys. He's saying, you need to understand something. I am not gonna not do what God has called me to do. This is what we have to do if, if we're going to grow these churches. There are churches up and down this highway that have not breached 90 people or 60 people or 120 people. They've been that way for hundreds of years. And Satan would be perfectly happy if you just sat there and did inreach and never did anything. But that's not what Jesus told us to do with the Great Commission. He said, I want you to go out into all the world. I want you to go out and spread the gospel. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a teacher. You don't have to be those things. But where you are, you have the opportunity to fill the seat right next to you because of the relationships that you build. I see so many people derailed because of issues that they've got or struggles that they have where Satan is trying to get at you. And watch this. If you're a Christian, he is. Your life of Christianity is not going to be this bed of roses where you just get to walk down. Life is great. And there's a little angel to spritz you with more rose spray so that you feel good about yourself and smell good. It doesn't happen that way. Watch this. When you decided to follow Christ, Satan came against you and attacked you. He said, I need to derail this guy. I need to derail this woman and shut their mouths. And he will attack your family. He will attack you. He will attack your character. And if you think it's by accident, it is not. To the point where you quit talking about it. And that's exactly what he wants you to do. He wants you not to say a word. I knew a young minister who went to a, a small town and then in that church was in decline for several years. And the church committee had expressed that the church was eager to experience growth. They called him to this church and said, man, we want to grow. We want to see young people back in the church. We want to be able to reach young families and, and children. And the church had not been effective in this ministry to young people for years. And so they called this guy to the church and he brought this new energy to the church with these ideas. And in six months, the worship attendance had grown 40%. People began joining the church. 
A new Sunday school class was started for these young couples. A new uh, praise band was started and, and choir was started so that they could reach more people and get them involved. And they added a contemporary type of a style to reach the people outside of its walls. The people were excited about the growth, especially all the young families that were attending. But then a concern was raised. raised. What could the concern be when you're growing like that? One of the elders of the church, true story, in all seriousness said, I'm concerned. All of a sudden, we have so many young people joining the church. Actually, I think we have too many young people joining the church, that's what he said. Is it a wonder why churches can struggle to reflect vitality? We seek to guard the status quo. It limits the work of the Holy Spirit. It impairs the ability of an effective witness in the community. He was upset because their senior adult Sunday school class was kind of getting crowded out and forgotten about. They didn't get the attention that they had. Listen to me. It's not about attention. It's not about power. It's not about control. It's not about those things. It's about winning the loss and getting the gospel, the good news to a world that desperately needs to hear it. The good news about all of that, that in spite of our fears and our lack of trust, we cannot completely restrict the Holy Spirit's work in the church. Churches are resilient in spite of the human factor. You can get in the way, but God's going to remove that. If I'm not doing God's will, he will remove me from the pulpit one way or the other. There is, watch this, a divine factor at work in the church. The criticism expressed to Peter in this passage certainly didn't keep the church from growing. We see the church explode because Peter decided to do what God called him to do. The same is true for us. God will have God's way in the church despite our personal agendas. It's God's purpose that that we can be fulfilled in the life of God's church. But there's some things we have to focus on that will enable our church to become more effective. Today's scripture passage leads us to those right objectives. There's three I wanna give you this morning. The first one is seek a vision from God. Seek a vision from God. I want you to know that Peter got the vision from God and he was told three times and he stuck to it, watch this, even if the people of tradition didn't like it, if we stick to God's word, if this is what we are going to base the growth of our church on, we cannot go wrong with this. Amen? Can I have a better amen? amen? Church, listen, we have to be able to execute on this, but in our own ways. Everyone who comes to the church has his or her own idea of what church should be and what that church wants to be. Some of you come from a traditional Baptist background. Some of you come from a, a healing place. Some of you guys come from a Catholic background. Some of you come from these different views where you come in here and you have a view of what church is supposed to be. But what Peter was told, he said, I just want you to bring my truth to those masses. I want you to bring the truth of God to the masses. This is what needs to be taught. You need to disciple them so that they will grow. That's what's going to cause growth, not your personal traditions. The challenge then is to derive unity in a church with people with those different views regarding the church's mission. What does that mean? That the unity comes from our relationship to Christ and the desire to please God. That means whatever your talents and skills are, then the church will grow. We should do a ministry to reach people who are addicted to things in life and they get involved in a ministry that is able to produce these cars and then they sell those cars at auctions and that money goes back in to be able to reach more people, that that's a ministry. I can't do that. If I got underneath a, 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 a one of the hoods of your cars, it ain't running. Probably when I'm done with it. <laughs> you, Chad Smith gets underneath that thing, it, it'll run like a, like a clock. He has a specific talent in that particular area of his life, that's him. David Sanders has that type of ability to fix things and make things with his hands and do those things. I, I can't do that. 
your different talents and, and things like that. His wife, Michelle, worked on some stuff for us for our school on, on a brochure. She has a talent that is able to look at things and put those things together. She had to take two or three or four or five or eight hours of her life and say, I'm going to commit this to God to be able to do it. And if all of us took our talents in our life and we, and we put it in there, we'd be able to do that. And we'd be able to make an impact. These guys who work on the stage, they're here every Thursday to practice so that they can bring something on Sunday morning that can bring us all or usher us all into a sense of worship. We each have those. Peter had a vision from God on the sheet about these animals, reptiles, birds, the clean, the unclean animals represented circumcision and uncircumcised people. What does that mean, 2021? It means the guys underneath the bridge of Baton Rouge. It means in the trailers next door to us. It means the guys on the other side of the train tracks. It means your neighbor that you don't necessarily talk to, watch this, because they're a little bit, they're a little bit, scratch that, they're a lot a bit different than you. And the thing that has stopped you from ministering to them is this difference. Here's the problem. Christ died for them. Here's the problem. Not only did he die for them, he loves them as much as he loves you. And he wants us to love them the same way. The sheep represented the church, which should include all people, regardless of their class or their race, their economic background. It's everybody. I don't care what your sin is. We all have sin, and none of us in this room or none of you watching at home walk on water. We all need grace, love, and mercy. Amen? So if we all need that grace, love, and mercy, it's just a matter of how much. Tom, you know, my wife might need an eight-ounce cup of mercy. I might need a big gulp, 32 ounces. You might need more, you might need less, but here's the deal. We all need mercy. We all need grace. Amen? Amen. So during this vision, a voice comes to Peter saying, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. He's talking in the reality here that the people you go out have to be a reflect the community that you're in. Does our church reflect the community? I don't think it does. I think this is part of, the, uh, of a, being a stumbling block. We need to be open and we need to embrace those people. He goes into the house of the guy that he knows he would be defiled if he would walk into the house. This is why the scripture verse says he goes into the guy's house. He saw Jesus model it when he went into Zacchaeus' house, but Zacchaeus was a Jewish guy. Even though he was despised by the Jews, this guy's not a Jewish guy. He is totally different. And he brings the gospel to his house. Watch this. And the different guy comes to know Jesus. And the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit came upon them just like it had done to him in Pentecost. He says, man, the good news has come to the whole world. Are we motivated? Are we motivated? It is God alone who is worthy of determining that which is appropriate in a church to be able to reach the lost. There was a young woman, she's eight months pregnant. She has a two-year-old boy. Her son locked himself in the bathroom. She was frightened, she was scared. Johnny, open up the door, please. (laughs) She starts hearing clinking and clunking in there. Open the door, Johnny, open it. No, no dice, it's not working. She goes, she gets a screwdriver. She takes the door handle off, hoping she can open the door. But without the handle on it, she can't open the door. But she sees through the hole, little Johnny in there, he's got the bathtub going now. It's filling up. He's got his dad's razors, his plastic razors, and he's putting them in there like little boats. And she's like, he's going to cut himself. Something bad's going to happen. And then he's crawling up on top of the sink. He opens the medicine cabinet. He takes out pill bottles and he's shaking them like, like little shakers. And he's having a blast in there. And she's like, Johnny, she calls her husband. She's panicked. He's like, our son's locked in the bathroom. He's got your pills in his hands. He's got razor blades in there. The water's going in the bathtub. You need to come home right away. The husband says, I'm going to be home. He rushes out of his work. He's running, uh, driving home as fast as he possibly can. And he opens up the door and he comes in and he sees his wife laying on the couch, breathing heavily with her two-year-old son. <sighs> He said, what, what happened? I thought he was locked in the bathroom. She said, well, I, got, I hung up the phone and I had an idea. I got an Oreo cookie. I held it up in the hole so that he could see it through the hole. And he opened the door just like that. 
Watch this. The boy had the ability to open the door all along. All he needed was a proper motivation. I think the same is true for the church. We have the ability to fulfill God's vision of the church that draws people together in unity, but we have to be properly motivated. It will require that we, watch this, set aside personal, watch this, that you, watch this, that we set aside personal agendas and seek God's agenda for the church. If we can work together to determine God's vision for the church, there is no limit to what can be accomplished for the good of God's kingdom. And I believe he's going to accomplish a great thing. I know Satan's going to attack us for doing the right thing. I know he is constantly going to come against you. And if you're a Christian this morning, I am sorry to inform you, but there isn't a little angel spraying you with a spritzer of rose mist. You are going to get attacked. Because if he can shut your mouth and stop you from being a witness to your spouse or your children, that's what he's going to do. If he can pull you out of the church because your feelings got hurt or something happened and, and, and you're like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going there anymore. I, I can't stand that guy. Then Satan accomplished really what the agenda was. Watch this. Which was to stop your relationship with Jesus Christ. This is why your pastor cannot be your friend. He has to be your pastor to equip and to train because these are tough things to read sometimes. But listen to me, I love you. I'll be there at three o'clock in the morning if the phone rings, just like I've been for 10 years of ministry here. But I need you to understand that you have a calling. You don't just have a pew to warm. You have a calling and if we work together, we can find God's vision. The second thing is, is we need to respond to God's leadership. It's a pretty neat, intriguing aspect of the scripture passage is the way in which Peter responded to God's leadership. Despite the criticism he received and the misgivings he might have had on his own, which was like, I'm not going to eat that pulled pork sandwich. I'm not going to go into that guy's house over in Baton Rouge underneath the bridge. I am not going to go into that place. Watch this. Peter followed God's lead. Will you follow God's lead in order to accomplish his will? Will you put aside personal hurts, agendas, and things that possibly has stopped you from growing and say, God, forgive me. <laughs> For walking away. And I'm here. Use me. In March, we're going to open up the children's ministry. I'm going to need a gazillion people to rock babies because this church is going to explode because I get calls every day. Is your church open yet? As soon as it can, I want to come. But I'm a single mom. I can't rock two babies at the same time. Peter went with the three men who came to him from Caesarea because the Spirit told him to do so. The same conviction you had in that last sentence that I just said that you have, maybe the Holy Spirit pricking your heart saying, I'm calling you, I'm calling you, I'm calling you. You are either going to respond to it or you're going to ignore it. But as a result of his faithfulness, Peter witnessed and experienced things he would otherwise have missed. I'm not talking about the pulled pork sandwiches and the baby back ribs. <laughs> He recognized that the Holy Spirit came upon the Gentiles in the same way that it came upon the Jewish Christians. So he asked if then God gave the same gift to them as he gives to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? Watch this. He loves the guy under the bridge as much as he loves you. He loves your spouse as much as he loves you. He loves that wayward child you might have as much as he loves you. He loves that person you can't stand at work as much as he loves you. He loves you unconditionally. And he loves them the same way. And he says, to fulfill my will and grow this church, we have to have that same heart. So who are we to stand in the way of God and God's desire for the church? 
So often our biases prevent us from opening our lives and renewing uh, the uh, presence of God. We're fearful of changes that, that might be required. So we close our hearts or we're not in control. So, so uh, I, I don't want to do it that way. I have to be in control. And he's saying, I'm not calling you to be in control. I'm not calling you to get in the way. I'm calling you to just follow me and serve and to love people unconditionally. Out of fear of unknown or stubborn refusal to grow in, in, in new directions, we refuse to risk the vulnerability that is required, watch this, that is required if we are to be truly open to God. Did you catch that? You have to be vulnerable in order for God to use you. The thing that scares you, the pride, the vanity, the thing that stops you from committing to Christ completely, he says you need to be vulnerable to that, to follow me. Not Tom Shepard, Christ. A woman went to her personal, to her pastor for personal counseling. She had been going to the church for several years, and after the minister had met with her, he realized she didn't really want to hear the truth. So she stopped going. She didn't want to hear the truth. I'm not going to go talk to Pastor Tom. I know what he's going to say. Did you just catch that? I don't want to talk to him because I know what he's going to say. I don't want to hear the truth. I'll go somewhere else. I'll go to a different church. I'll go see a different counselor. I'll go somewhere else. Her pastor told her she needed professional counseling, but she needed biblical professional counseling. She finally got it. It was two years later that she came back, and she went to her pastor, and she gave him a big hug, and she said, I need you to forgive me. He said, for what? For rejecting truth. You gave me advice, and I didn't want to hear it. I didn't like hearing it, but it saved my marriage. And she hugged him again. He had told her if he would follow God, the person you're married to would not be the same person you married at the very beginning. I am not the same person my wife married. She is not the same person I married. We have come a long way and God has done a miraculous thing in her life and in my life. And the blessing was understanding that God can totally transform somebody but it will take faith. She hugged him. She moved on. I wonder how many blessings we miss out on because we stubbornly refuse to hear the message God sends our way. Instead of seeking to determine God's will for our lives, we seek God's approval for what we want to do. God, I, I don't like that plan. I, I want to do this, so please bless this so that I can do this, so that we can do this please bless this. And God's saying, no, I called you and it wasn't a mistake five years ago, but you walked away. Jesus repeats over and over and over to his disciples all through the New Testament. Follow me, follow me, follow me. How many times have we walked away? We limit God's purpose for us with our lack of vision and our lack of expectancy about what God can do in and through us. Some of you have doubt. I, I can't be used. That's why I'm not going to volunteer. I, I'm not going to be able to be used of God. I don't, I don't have any special skills or talents. Yes, you do. God doesn't create junk. He created you for a purpose, and you have a purpose in this world. Amen? Amen. Do you remember what Peter said? He said, who am I to hinder God? We could ask the same question ourselves. Who are we to stand in God's way? When we're truly open to God's leadership, the Christian way of life becomes exciting and unpredictable. As we learn to trust God's direction for our lives, we discover blessings and new meanings for our lives. It brings me to the last point that you need to understand. When you follow God's will, you need to expect God's blessings. We need to learn to live with expectancy and hopefulness about what God has planned for us. If we genuinely trust God and God's provision, We'll be excited about what the future holds for us, regardless of the circumstances of our lives. 
God will teach us and he will sustain every one of our needs. A child, watch this, a child growing up in a loving, supportive environment does not worry about what the future will bring. His parents are providing for all his needs, physical, emotional, social, and, and they, they always have. So life is joyous for that person's life. It's an adventure to be shared with, with other loved ones. He eagerly anticipates the new experiences each day at home. What are we going to do today, mom? What, what are we going to do this Saturday? What, what are we? They're excited about it. I understand and I can resonate with this. As a young boy, and my mom being divorced and, and us being so poor one year, we have to, to move to the other side of the border and live in Tijuana in Mexico because we were too poor to live in the United States. I didn't know where the next meal was coming from. I didn't know if we were going to eat. I always asked what was for dinner. I always asked what we were having next because I didn't know. Some of us live our spiritual life that way because we're not following Christ, we're following our own agendas. And every time our agenda gets stepped on, we get mad. Our faith and our trust has to be in Christ alone. One of the blessings of Peter was seeing the way God brought him through this entire thing in a wonderful way. As a band comes forward, I want to share with you one last verse this morning. Have you come in the name of Jesus Christ? Have you come in the name of love? Do you trust, listen to me, do you trust you or do you really trust him? Do you really think he can move mountains into the oceans? We just sang it earlier. Do you really think he can move a mountain into the ocean in your life? The verse I wanted to share with you is from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. It's important for a church with vision to be of one heart and one accord. Ephesians chapter 4 verses four through six says this. There is one body and one spirit, just as, watch this and don't miss it, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. This is not to the church of pastors at Ephesus. This is not to the church of deacons at Ephesus. This is not to the church of directors at Ephesus. It is to the people, to the Christians at Ephesus, that you have a calling, that you have been called to do something with your life, that to grow God's church, to build a kingdom, to see young people come to know Christ as Savior will be a challenge for you and for me to hold hands together and walk through it together. Your calling. There is one body and one spirit just as you also were called in one hope of your calling. And he ends it like this. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. If you're a Christian this morning, watching from home or here, you have a calling. My question to you is, have you fulfilled it? My question is, what is God going to do with you? If you're missing joy in your life, it may be because you've wandered off. And if you're a person here this morning who has never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have an opportunity to say, God, here I am. So you come forward and you nail that down. I want to pray with you and nail that down with you because that's what he said to do. To confess him, profess him publicly and be baptized 
because the Holy Spirit comes upon you after you profess him publicly. That's why we do that. That's why Jesus said to do it that way. And just like the Gentiles, you will see a massive change in your life. Let's stand together. Father, we come before you, and if there's a person here who needs to make a decision this morning, perhaps to join this church, or perhaps to accept you as Lord and Savior, I pray that this morning is their day, but that they would understand that this is a covenant between them and you. <clears throat> so Lord, as we sing, I pray if there's somebody here who needs to make a decision that they would come. For we ask this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. You come if you have a decision. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I am Pastor Tom Shepard, the lead pastor at the Church at Addis. I pray you were blessed by God's word. If you're watching and would like to become part of this fellowship, there are two options. First, if you have not received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and today's message spoke to you and perhaps convicted you in some way, I want to walk you through that right now. I will lead you through a prayer in a moment that is going to give you an opportunity to make an honest decision on whether you will choose to follow Jesus and make him Lord of your life. This is going to be a defining moment for you. If you desire that relationship with Jesus Christ, bow your head right where you are and repeat after me this prayer. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I know I might not know a lot about you, but I believe that you died on a cross and the blood you shed paid for my sins. I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins, my past, I am turning away from those sins and I am choosing to surrender to you as my personal Lord and Savior. I believe you were buried and raised again from the dead so that I could have eternal life. And I choose from this day forward to do my very best to follow you. For I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, now my Lord and Savior, amen. Hey, look at me for a second. If you just prayed that prayer and meant it, let me be the first one to say congratulations. You are now a child of God. There is nothing or no one who can take that away from you. In fact, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, that I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above, or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know what else? Luke 15, 10 says that every angel in heaven is shouting out for joy right now for your salvation. Isn't that awesome? I want you to do me a favor. If you're close enough, I want you to call us here at the church on the number you see below. I want to sit down with you or zoom you in on a call if you're in another state or country and get some stuff in your hands that is going to take you on the most exciting, fulfilling journey in your lifetime. I look forward to meeting with you, getting to know you and getting you plugged in. Second, if you've already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've been baptized as a new believer in Christ, but you are looking for a place to call home, all you need to do is email your name, address, and telephone number so that I may contact you via phone or Zoom or visit, whichever is convenient. We will then get you access to our extensive online discipleship curriculum, which is chocked full of great stuff for you and your entire family. We will then get a packet out to you telling you all about your membership with your new church family. Accountability and fellowship are so important. Getting connected will solidify your growth and you will create some awesome new friends. I'm so excited about getting to know you and getting you connected on this new journey. Don't wait, contact us now.